Mark, maybe we start with you, but just any reactions to some of the policies that I threw out or some of the rankings and where you think things can go forward for the state of North Carolina? Well, we're definitely on the right track and there's a lot of hard work going on. Uh, one thing I'd like to point out is, uh, I see a lot of people in this room who probably already have seen it, but the, uh, the new school report cards website is something we're really, we're really proud of at DPI. We worked really hard with our partners at SAS on that. Uh, over the course of the last year, and it's at schoolreportcards.nc.gov, and really wanting to better tell the story of a school. Uh, you know, one reason there's such a heavy weight on proficiency is because we do want third graders to read proficiently in third grade. We do want graduates, when they walk across the stage with a diploma, to be able to say they are proficient. They will, they will go forward and they will succeed. Uh, but we also acknowledge how important growth is. And, uh, one little thing we did at the department last year was we actually launched the NC Superintendent's Growth Awards, and it really was just an acknowledgement of a certificate and a, a badge if a school met growth or exceeded growth, and we sent that out to every principal that did, um, and I really was uh, humbled and honored with the uh, really positive reception we got back from that for just acknowledging it. Uh, but some other tools we put in the NC School Report Card, uh, first we highlighted the link to the school's web page so we told principals go out and tell your story at your school uh, if you don't feel like this is the full picture here's your opportunity go tell your story on your school page and we also made some more tools based on my experience teaching in a, uh, a school that catered to students coming from severe economic distress uh, one was the economically disadvantaged meter so that people could have that as a gauge to tell the story behind what the school's struggles were Another one that we're really excited about is the incoming student readiness factor. So you talked about the kindergarten entry assessment, which uh, we're, we're working on building that in for the elementary school. But right now what you'll see for middle schools and high schools is based on where students scored before they entered that school, how ready were they before they came in? And that's another uh, piece of the puzzle to why we are getting the proficiency scores that we're seeing. So we're really excited about, about those changes. Great. Janet, from the district perspective, I mean, being superintendent of the year, how does this all resound with you? And what are your thoughts on some of the comments? Well, if you would allow me, I'd like to share something you addressed about early college. Um, and it is a district perspective, but I have many colleagues across the state, and we've shared with one another about how important that is to many families, particularly those who are economically disadvantaged. Um, I was fortunate enough in 2005 to work on the team that helped create our early college, which is at Isothermal Community College, um, REACH, we call it, Rutherford Early College, and it's a National Blue Ribbon winner. We've been recognized for multiple years for 100% graduation rate, and we have many students there who leave and then matriculate to the university system that do very well. We have many who leave and go directly into the job force. Um, but the thing that we've seen there is that it was really a catalyst for change for our other traditional high schools. And so after we saw the results there, we began to talk about with our folks, how do we take this and make it available on a greater level with the traditional high school students who like being in that comfort, more comprehensive high school, not this special boutique school. How do we get those same results? Because I challenge my principals. If 100% graduation rate is possible there, why is it not possible in your school? And you know, they have a lot of reasons, but we begin to talk about, well, how do we support you and how do we create policies in our system that make that more possible? And we've begun to see students in our traditional high schools graduating with an associate's degree from Isothermal Community College and then at their traditional high school. So they're not in an early college. They're still in the ones you think of that you went to school, that I went to school where we attended. And so I think that's an important thing for our state. If we are truly committed to thinking about, committing to creating an accelerated um, approach to gaining workforce readyability, ability, then we need to be again looking at what are we doing to accelerate that high school experience and the college experience for more students than they're just in these boutique schools. Jennifer? Thank you. So, Jeremy, you began your remarks talking about education leaders being able to talk with each other, and I do want to assure our leaders of this state that you have that in North Carolina. And in fact, we began 2018 at 18 Seaboard, um, all of the education leaders and, and um, a member of our senior staff having dinner 
building our relationships and, and talking about how we can work together. So I want to assure you that those relationships are here in North Carolina. I want to go from dual enrollment and our partnership with community colleges with our uh, public schools to our senior partners and really have made a lot of headway since 2014 when it comes to articulation. That was the year where we signed a strengthened comprehensive articulation agreement both with the university system and our um, North Carolina independent colleges and universities. Since that time we've also developed um, articulation agreements specifically for engineering, um, nursing, RN to BSN, as well as some of our fine arts and are now looking to develop one specifically for teacher preparation. What I don't think that we've done a great job on is figuring out how do we both market, like you said, these opportunities, but also we've done a good job building these pathways, but is, are those pathways clear to students? And do we have the tools and technology so that they can clearly see the map that we're trying to develop from how to get from A to B? Uh -huh. I want to pick up on where Jennifer left off, and that is that we have this kind of a crazy quilt system uh, that's very difficult for the user. There's a lot of friction in the system, and within the, the university system itself. Uh, so we can, uh, part of the, the effort that we've launched, and I see Christy Teske and MC Bell Pylon, is this My Future and C Commission, which is to think about the continuum broadly. And, Rest assured, it will go out of business when it concludes its work because it, we're one of just a few states that have not articulated statewide post-secondary attainment goals that, that <coughs> have now the high school and, and beyond. So taking out the friction for our user, our student, our consumer, uh, making those pathways more clear and you know having that transferability, common course numbering, advanced placement, things that are more uniform and standardized, I know that offends a lot of people, but that's how you make progress in simple ways for the masses. So Margaret, continuing on that, talk a little bit about some of the accountability and how you educate the parents in you know, why accountability might be important and how it helps them make choices in what they're getting as far as education. Well, first I think we have, and, and um, other states have done this, where we have to engender a college going, post-secondary going, not just a four-year baccalaureate, obviously, uh, but that, you know, the expectation for our students and our citizens is, is higher education beyond high school. And so we need to create a campaign around that, that that is our expectations as citizens so that we don't look at data like you're, you're, you're showing us. We are investing heavily in the university. We have made a lot of progress and we have a lot to be proud of. But I don't think we've done as good a job as we can with convincing our patrons uh, that, that this is a, a great value proposition and we've made it simple for you to access. So marketing, taking out the seams and friction, connecting each uh, these dots a little better, more clearly for them, and then uh, showing them that we have a value proposition that is worth investing in. We're proud of the kind of affordability. We always rank in the bottom quartile among states. College is accessible in North Carolina, but what is the value beyond their uh, their matriculation, that's what we need to do a better job of. That's great, thank you. Jennifer, we talked a lot about some of the K-12 issues around um, teachers and educators. Are you seeing similar um, opportunities or concerns um, at the community college or post-secondary level? Absolutely. Um, we're very proud of the progress that North Carolina has made on teacher pay. Obviously that's a critical issue because we all know that our, our students won't be successful if they don't have high quality teachers in the classroom. But we're struggling to get high quality instructors and faculty in our classrooms as well. And indeed, when you look at the average salary data that you presented in that same year, the average faculty salary for our community colleges is actually $500 below the data average salary for public schools. Um, we rank 41st in the nation in faculty salaries. And that is becoming a bit of a crisis point, particularly as we have the retirement wave that has officially hit. I know it's hit all of our sectors. And being able to attract students into wanting to be teachers at our institutions is an equally tough challenge these days. So Janet, talk about some of the policies we've discussed and what does it feel like from your perspective as a superintendent? I mean, I always love getting that other perspective because in many states, uh, I mean, we discuss things in the state capitol with like-minded people who aren't always in the schools actually trying to do this implementation part of it. 
I mean, what would you change if you had a magic wand on some of this? That's a dangerous question for me. <laughs> There's one thing I wanted to change for a while. <clears throat> You've given me the bully pulpit, so I'm going to share it. I think we, we really, truly need to make sure we keep college access affordable to North Carolina families, and I think that's one of the statistics that you've shown. I'm not ashamed to say we invest more in our higher ed so that our families can afford it because many families would never choose that option. But I'm going to get on a different different place right now. I'm hearing a lot about graduation rate and maybe a criticism of um, some of the mechanisms we use to help students who struggle. You reference students who've had children. So it brings to mind to me someone who had a baby toward the end of a semester and she would have lost all those credits while she was home. She didn't have the support of someone who could help get, take care of the baby. It was a really terrible situation. So we brought it back and we used credit recovery. And credit recovery is almost moving into some dangerous territory. People um, and maybe misunderstand what it is, or maybe in some places it's misused. But it's a valuable tool for someone who did, let's say, four-fifths of a course. And the teacher involved with that student knows what that student missed. We're really going to ask her to go back and do the first four fifths again when all she missed was that remaining fifth when she encountered a difficult life situation. So that's one of those things that I think when people look at some statistics or they read an article about it, it sounds like, oh, those school systems are doing something to try to circumvent high quality and rigorous standards. And what we're really trying to do is meet students where they are in their real lives in their real struggles so that the, you know those students can contribute to North Carolina. I'm proud to say that that young lady did using our technology. She did some credit recovery, working with her teachers. They went above and beyond what you might have expected teachers would do. And she was on track to graduate. And in fact, she, she actually graduated this semester and is enrolled now at Isothermal Community College and she has an eight month old baby. So I'm really proud about that. But I think if we don't connect to those real human stories, then someone's going to read a policy brief that says credit recovery is a way that states are artificially inflating graduation rates and they're going to miss the entire point of using it as a tool, holding people accountable for using it appropriately, but using it as a tool to help kids in who are actually struggling. So a good segue there. Mark, talk a little bit about personalized learning and what you see as the wave of the future. We get a lot of calls at Education Commission of the States on this issue specifically, and states are trying to figure out, you know, how do we adapt for some of these changes? I think Janet's example there is a good one. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I mean, personalized learning, it's still so new that we are even talking to educators about what it means, but it's kind of, it's, it's that talking point of how North Carolina is actually ahead of the game and working in the right direction with our digital learning plan. Uh, personalized learning is this idea that right now we're all carrying around these smart devices, these tablets or these phones. I mean, anything that's ever happened in human history, you can look up on that device. So are we really at the point in education where we need to be putting out tests that just, you know, measure how much a student has memorized of facts and figures? Or is it time to start using this technology and the adaptive content on it to really start moving students towards critical thinking and, and collaboration? Uh, you know, we personalize our social media, we personalize our entertainment, you can personalize your fast food order before you walk into a restaurant and pick it up. It, it, is it time now to use that same adaptive content in the classroom? And I always preface that with, this is not talking about replacing teachers with technology. That is not at all what this is. The teacher will always be the most important part of the classroom. This actually, the message we have to get out is this is actually a tool for teachers to use in the classroom to actually reduce the burdens they have in differentiation and in assessing where students are for a formative assessment. I have seen this adaptive content that you know, it captures those students that might be the five at the back of the class that are always sleeping, that never raise their hands. Uh, it can actually engage them and empower them to catch up because it works at their pace. At the same time, those five students that are your high flyers that might otherwise be bored with the standard pace, they can, they can achieve, they can go grade levels ahead, and then they can go into our dual enrollment and graduate with a high school diploma and a uh, associate's degree at the, at the same time. I think the, the potential for this is extraordinary. It's now just a matter of us using the high-speed internet connections we have in our schools uh, to get the right adaptive content and the right professional development for teachers. 
to make this a tool for them to actually move away from that industrial age model of front of the class, uh, standard pace, standard facts, standardized tests to instructional facilitators that actually empower students to take advantage of their own uh, learning. Really excited about the future for that. That's great. In education policy, we tend to be a little slow with change, and it's hard. I always use the example um, from my son. When he started kindergarten, it was the first year of No Child Left Behind. Wait a minute. I don't know. <laughs> when my son graduated high school, he was still under No Child Left Behind, and Apple had released seven different iPhones. And so it's not whether it's good or bad policy, we're slow to adapt on some of these opportunities and where new policies might be there. And I think that'd be a good segue to have you kind of talk, you know, what are some of the innovative policies that you wish you could get the opportunity to move forward on? And again, some of these we're seeing in states are not always uh, major investments. Sometimes it's a change in just how you're looking at things. I use an example from Louisiana a lot, but this is the first year, the graduating seniors this year in Louisiana, um, that they have to have a federal financial aid form filled out in order to graduate high school. And the policy lever there by the legislature is to try to open up the dialogue around dining room tables in families where maybe that conversation isn't taking place, that we have an opportunity <coughs> here to maybe go to a community college or career in tech ed. That policy didn't cost any money for Louisiana, but they're going to see whether it's meaningful. What are those innovative policies that you see in early learning or with teachers or even on some of the transitions to post-secondary? I'll start because Dr. Petrie Martin is here and she's the Deputy State Superintendent and I know we want to make every graduate take, uh, fill out the FAFSA, so we've got one. Thank you. Um, and then also something Louisiana is doing that actually is working. Uh, a big thanks to the General Assembly for giving us funding to do a deep dive operational assessment of the Department of Public Instruction and really be able to categorize and understand where all the federal funding is. Uh, I've spoken with the state chief in Louisiana and something they've done is they've also, uh, they've been, they, they give out the student, uh, the, the federal grants for school improvement, uh, but they also can put uh, qualifications with it of, you have to use this approved curriculum one that is very high quality, or you have to use this type of professional development. So, you know, you're sending out money, but you also know that it's going to programs that work as opposed to sending out money year after year after year, and sometimes not knowing if, if the programs are working or not. So that's something we're very excited about, and that work should be done around April and give us a better picture of where everything is going out of the department. You're gonna, I'm going to sound like an Uber policy wonk right now, but we have to have an accountability continuum across K-12 and into the community colleges and higher education that is coherent and makes sense, that has enough management information that can let us run the enterprise, understand where we spend money, and so on. And when we do, we'll, we'll move the needle. But we have a lot of friction across the continuum here in the way that we're organized, or not organized, and in the way that we interact with our with our patrons and our and our citizens and our students, and so I think we can do a whole lot better on that. It's a, I used to say in my secretarial days, it's as if we are trying to keep people out of college, not not get them in. The way it is such a Byzantine and complicated uh, system. So I, I, I'm a you know data hawk. Continue to be. The other thing, as I, this is the era of local control, Washington is out of business. And so what does that mean for this is a great time to be in states, which is, you know, we gotta watch the fine print. We gotta watch exemption rates and disaggregation of data and management systems that are coherent and speak across the continuum and on and on. I mean uber wonkery, but it just has to make sense to policymakers and then we can channel our investments around things that work. It, it, just to interrupt, it is the era where states have a lot more power, and the question is, are states going to take advantage of that freedom that they've been given to do things innovatively? We tried it for 150 years. It didn't work very well. Okay. We're going to try it again. Data is one of those big areas where we see states looking at things. How are you tracking early learning children and what their outcomes are? And how are you making sure that when they're coming into school, it's not the first time you're getting an evaluation of where that child is, but you already know what the roadmap is to get that child to a third grade reading level. 
some of that use of data is a real difficult thing for states. Those states that can figure out, and you've already got a P20 system that is there and it's centralized, those states that can figure out how to use that data for better outcomes are going to be the ones that every other state is wanting to come and learn from. I'm going to pivot a little bit and talk about work-based learning. And I think that's an uh, area that I feel like our state is engaged in, but needs to make some strides in trying to better incorporate work-based learning across our sectors. Um, at the community college system, obviously, we're very focused on workforce preparedness, but we think that we need to have our students back in middle school be exposed to different industries so that they can take op the opportunity to learn what occupational opportunities are out there have the opportunity to perhaps shadow, to engage in mentorships, um, apprenticeships, these types of activities so that when they do come for post-secondary training, they have some idea of where they might want to go. Because what we're seeing is the reason a lot of our students have a long time and a very circuitous route towards a credential is because they don't really know what they want to do and they haven't had those um, opportunities to explore in a rigor rigorous and systematic way. Um, to prepare them for making cho in informed choices. Janet? Want to add to that? Um, I think one of the things that I wanted to be sure that I was able to share is uh, related to policy and, and something that I think we should consider as a state and move quickly on is, uh, and I say that knowing that this is probably, um, there would be varied opinions on whether or not this is something we should do. But there's just been a huge push to make sure that we don't treat juveniles in the court system as adults. And we've raised that age, yet we still allow students to leave our schools at 16 without having earned a diploma. I'm all about accelerating. I'd love to see them go on to the community college or to some technical opportunity or to, even to the university if they accelerate and graduate by 16. But I think that we're, we are going to have to grapple with that at some point as a state that we've decided that at 16, you can decide to end your education. I deal with many parents who, um, when they approach us and say, we want you to sign and he's going to drop out, the parent says to me, you know, the state says he can go, so who am I to tell him he can't? And, you know, as a, as a mom myself, I'm looking, as a mom who was raised by a really tough mom and dad, I want to say, well, where is he sleeping? Who's paying for his cell phone? Yes, you can tell him. But we deal with many parents who their family structure is not that way. I have, we are fortunate to be in a compulsory attendance pilot where we are one of three systems that has been raised to 18 in our district. And there are some challenges. And I'm going to tell you, it's like I fought for this and then we got it. It's like, oh gosh, did I really want this? Because it's tougher than it seems. But I, I mentor 15 students in my school system through a private uh, McNair Foundation where all of our students in 7th through 12th grade have an adult mentor who comes in and works with them. So I have 15, and I have a young lady from a family of all dropouts, mom and dad and six siblings, and she's the baby. And she shares with me when I'm in there talking to her about passing school and attending, you know, she shares with me about um, <coughs> they all dropped out and brothers moved back home with this bad problem and all these other issues. And we just got in this pilot. It just came into effect in August. And so we were talking about this, and she was sharing with me that brothers and sisters aren't doing well. She said, you know, everybody dropped out. My mom dropped out. Everybody dropped out. And so I take that moment to try to see this conversation and say, but you're not going to drop out, are you, Mystic? And she said, no, I can't, because you know what? She said, in her seventh grade voice, she said, they changed the law in Rutherford County. <laughs> she said, I can't even drop out until I'm 18, and I'm going to turn 18 my, in January of my senior year, and that'd just be stupid to drop out then. <laughs> and I said, glory, hallelujah. And I said, yeah. <laughs> actually, I looked at her, I said, they did. They changed the law because I've been fighting to do that. And thanks to the General Assembly, we were included in a pilot. We're one of three, and it is not easy. My, I've got counselors who are struggling with it. You know, parents are coming in that they give me all the reasons their child should go. But I believe in the end it's going to help us in Rutherford County and I think will be a good test case for all across the state. We've not been able to move the needle on the dropout data. We've lagged behind the state as long as the state's been tracking it. And I just said if we did if we don't do something bold, we'll still be ten years from now, twenty years from now, we're like, oh, we're lower than the state average. Oh, it's improved, but we're still lower than the state average. That's not acceptable. And so I think as a state, we ought to begin that conversation to say, you can't be treated as an adult while you're 16 or 17, but we're going to let you make a very adult decision that impacts not only you, you today, but the children you will produce and the family you will create and the community in which you will live for the rest of your life.
This is why Janet's the superintendent of the community. <laughs> and we see a lot of states struggling with that very issue. I mean, it's hard sometimes for policymakers to move the compulsory attendance age, and they worry about what are independent rights, what should we do? But I mean, just to play devil's advocate, North Carolina requires kindergarten to be attended all day. So I mean, at which end of the learning spectrum are you going to require people to be and what is the outcome that you're going to get out of that? I think it's a tough one for some state legislators to have to grapple with because there's implications. <coughs> the question I would just push for a lot of states to consider more, North Carolina in particular, what do you want from that child that you've now invested probably at least 10 years of important financial and training into to become? And if you're looking for the workforce to be filled, for it to be career and training, for it to be some kind of post-secondary, you've got to make sure that your policies align with that. And I think that's part of what I was talking about with the NAEP scores, where you've got a lot of good early learning programs, and you've got pretty good on your NAEP for fourth grade proficiency, and it drops. Well, that's in that same spot where you're talking about them dropping out because of where the compulsory age is. I don't know what that age is. I'm not paid to make any decisions, just to look at you and let you make them. But I think it's something you should take up. So let's talk a little bit about what you see on the horizon for North Carolina. I mean, looking out two years, that's always tough. And I say two years is tough because you've got to remember, nothing about you, Mark, you're elected for four years, so this doesn't apply. But the average chief state school officer in America, their tenure right now is two years, four months. We are going to have a period here from 2017 to 2018 where because of a host of retirements, some term limits, and some governors who left for various reasons, we are going to have 30 new governors in a two-year period. By January 2019, 30 of the 50 governors are guaranteed to be new, and that assumes every incumbent governor runs for re-election and wins, and that won't happen. So with that kind of turnover, two years seems like it's a long ways out. But if you had an opportunity to think, what is the one thing that you can truly make a difference for the future of North Carolina if everybody in this room worked together? Politics aside, territory aside, doesn't matter if you're in early learning or post-secondary, if you're in K-12, what's the one thing that you would focus on that you think that you could actually make a difference in the next two years? And then have the commission dismantle after two years. So you don't <laughs> We're really excited about career pathways, and I think that goes into the work that we've all been talking about here. Um, the idea that uh, really making the cultural shift of not everyone has to go to the four-year institution to be successful, and North Carolina is such a prime example of that with the amount of jobs we have out uh, across the state. I think the latest, the latest openings for computer science jobs is 17,000 in our state. Now that ranges from high school diploma all the way up to master's degree, but that's also a lot of associate's degrees or technical certifications that are really talking about reaching down to those students who might not think anything else of their future. Reaching down to them in middle school and giving them the knowledge and empowering them with, this is something that you can do and it is a it is a version of success that everyone should be proud of. And this leads to a career, it leads to a house, it leads to you know, vacations, it leads to security for your family. And really having those discussions early on in middle school, talking to students about, this is about the path you choose. Uh, if you want to go to a four-year institution, we are, gonna, we are gonna prepare you, we are gonna support you, but it's not the only option. And my, people have heard me say this, my favorite example uh, right now is power alignment, which being a power alignment requires a high school diploma, a few years of extra, a few months of extra training, and after a few years on the job, you can be making six figures because of the difficulty of the job and the overtime pay. But in North Carolina, we are about to have the retirement wave of power alignment. They're all coming up on retirement age, and energy companies are going to be scrambling, but we don't have the talent pipeline to fill those positions. There are so many students that are on the verge of dropping out or that maybe will barely graduate but then not really have a prospect that this is a career pathway for them that can really equal success. And uh, another one of my favorite examples are auto technicians. I mean, it is, it is not the auto technician of 50 years ago. I mean, the auto workshops now are cleaner than my office. And they are places where you have to have the skills to operate the equipment 
Uh, but you're talking fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars a year, and uh, you walk into any of these uh, automotive shops and ask them, "Are you having trouble finding uh, people who are qualified to fill these positions?" And they'll say, "Absolutely." I, mean, I talked to one of the major ones here in North Carolina, and they've got hundreds of vacancies that they could fill right now. And we need to connect our students who are on the verge of dropping out with, with those pathways. And I think you'll see a lot of that over the next two years here in North Carolina. Janet? Oh, it's education policy, but it may not be the thing that I thought I would come when I was asked to speak today that I would bring this up. But my good colleague, friend and colleague Patrick Miller's here from Green County. And I would say that all North Carolina superintendents would tell you that the most important thing that we know parents want when they send their children to us every day, whether they put them on the bus or they drop them off in the car right along, is that they're able to get them home safely at the end of the day. And so I would like to see in the next two years that we address the issue of school safety and protecting our children in a way that is meaningful and is, is actually something that would protect our children. We know that by 2020, 67% of the jobs in the state will require post-secondary training. We also know that affordability and student debt are at crises, at crisis points. And yet, where we see students hobbled by debt the most is when they have taken on debt and have not gotten a credential. And yet, we have students who have completed successfully a number of credits, who have not been awarded a credential, and you talked about reverse transfer before, we've got some good work going on, but I think that's where we have some very low hanging fruit, where we should, we have no excuse for not data mining, or, or mining our own data, so that we can figure out where we should be awarding um, credentials because the student has deserved it, and how can we reach back to those students who are like part way home, I know is the phrase that UNC likes to use, but we have tons of students who I believe have done the work and we have taken a, a, made a lot of progress on our credit for prior learning policies so that we can award credit for for instance military training and other situations and I think that's where we can have the um, quickest um, success in increasing higher education attainment. Jeremy, Jennifer keeps stealing my talking points. <laughs> uh, so I'll be wonky again and say that I think we need to get ourselves organized for success, as I like to say. And that is that we need to be very hawkish and clear with ourselves about data and outcomes and you know, set those high expectations for every one of our institutions. And then we ought to figure out how we're going to align accountability and authority. We cannot sit up here in Raleigh or Chapel Hill or wherever we're uh, cited and command and control every single uh, situation. And, and we're very quite prescriptive in the state about a lot of stuff because we've taken too light a hand on accountability, <coughs> outcomes, transparency, etc., and too heavy of a hand, in my view, on inputs and requirements. And I well, there's five really good issues. When you think about it, there are many others, but finding one of those five even that you could collaborate together, everyone in this room to say, what could we achieve in 24 months would really be the kind of amazing goal that other states would be looking at. Whether it's teacher pipeline, career pathways, school safety, looking at adult learners and reverse transfer, as Jennifer talked about, or I'm kind of a wonk like Margaret, so I love this stuff too. What are your goals for the state? How are you going to hold yourself accountable? And what is the governance to actually make that happen? That's a really hard one in states to figure out those three things, but you can't do one of them without the other two coming into play. So please join me in thanking our panel for their great work. <laughs>